I was born in January 1945 at the end of the Second World War. Two months later, my mother died. That de deprived me of a mother, obviously, but also shattered our very small family. We were blessed with the uh, arrival of my aunt, who was a nurse in London. Couldn't leave her post until the end of the Second World War, so when I was around four months old, she came and looked after us, and we lived as a nuclear family. Um, quite normally, I always suffered quietly from shyness and social anxiety, but uh, it wasn't uh, debilitating enough that I didn't graduate from school and uh, uh, went to art school in Brighton. Uh, and then went to, uh, came to London to work as an illustrator and also took a job as a teacher in a college for three and a half days a week. And for the other three and a half days a week at some point, I couldn't get out of bed. I had no idea really what had happened um, and thought it was probably physiological, maybe a lack of iron or something similar. Um, I pretty much thought that psychology was spelt with an S and had no clue that this event in my life uh, was predicated by uh, my mother's passing. Um, I was given by a, <laughs> a friend a book called The Primal Scream by Arthur Janoff, which had just been published, and he um, made it clear that, in fact, um, such an event in one's early life would have uh, uh, deleterious effects going forward. And uh, so having read the book, I thought, well, what do I do now? Read War and Peace. Um, I had to do something about it. And uh, it was clearly happening in the United States. So I went to New York and began uh, attending experiential um, primal groups, the only emotion that I could identify that I had was anger. So I spent a lot of time ranting and raving in uh, supported spaces and found that at a certain point, the anger, it didn't abate. But at a point of exhaustion, I could actually feel what was behind the anger, the grief, the loss, etc. And in this way became connected to my emotional self which, uh, looking back, I, had, I could count literally three episodes in my life where I wept all throughout these 27 years. Um, and all were major, major events. I just had absolutely no access to my emotions. But by doing primal work and near Riken emotional release work, uh, I was able to uh, substantiate that um, contact with my emotional self, and went forward feeling better and able to function better, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in 1992, 20 years later, I went in 1972 to, to New York, um, I was introduced to uh, uh, holotropic breathwork and found in that work uh, a substantiation of the work I'd done in terms of connecting myself to my emotions so that one could spend a period of time with oneself where one's emotions were primary and the cognitive ability was secondary. It was still function, but it was secondary. Um, but what the breath work also did was to allow for the spiritual dimension, uh, the transpersonal dimension to occur. And uh, my... Um, uh, feeling at the time was I found my tribe. These are my kind of people. Uh, and how come nobody ever told me about this? But also the fact that uh, it seemed that people who could contact each other on the same, on, on, on the level that people contact each other when they are emotionally open, allowed for the possibility of real community. The, a real contact with the, one's fellow human beings could then extend to... Uh, to community. So I practiced this for a couple of years around New York um, and then entered the training with Stan Groff in 19, uh, 1994 and studied with him for two years uh, uh, 
different week-long modules. Um, and during that time, uh, was introduced to uh, a, a hypothesis by an Irish doctor called Ivor Brown. Stan had come from the States to work with Ivor Brown in Dublin, uh, and they had exchanged fruitfully uh, their uh, you know, shared experiences. They worked together in, in workshops in, in Dublin. Um, and Ivor uh, had developed at that time uh, a hypothesis which uh, was published in the Irish Journal of Psychiatry in 1985 and to this day has not received one citation from the psychiatric orthodoxy. Uh, Stan was interested in this hypothesis and uh, introduced it to us in the, uh, in the training. And as soon as I heard it, I said, that's right on. That is exactly what I had experienced, but had not been able to articulate to myself or anybody else. But it was the, the, the hypothesis basically states that when we are traumatized, the organism, now the particular mechanisms within the organisms have yet to be, organism has yet to be determined, but that the organism, let's say the psyche, cuts us off from the full emotional impact of the trauma, believing that trauma to be deleterious to our uh, homeostasis, our balance, which is the primary task of the, of the body, of the organism, is to stay in balance. And in cutting us off from our ordinary consciousness of the event or events that are happening, we go, by definition, into a non-ordinary state of consciousness. If we are in ordinary consciousness as we are now, um, that's one thing. If we go into any other state, that is a non-ordinary state of consciousness. And in this non-ordinary state, the emotional details, the graphic details, the full experience of the trauma that has been suffered is caught and held within the body. Uh, Bessel van der Kolk uh, has uh, spent a lifetime written a book called The Body Keeps the Score, in which uh, this uh, hypothesis of trauma being held, caught and held in the body is made explicit. Uh, Ivor Brown calls it, uh, describes the, the, this holding within the body as incohate. We do not have access to the memory, the full memory of the trauma. Um, uh, through normal memory channels. We can't remember it by long-term memory. But there's, we have no access to it. Now, this may be uh, a total amnesia, a total non-recall, or we may remember parts of it. We remember, may remember that we're raped, but we don't remember the details. And it's actually interesting to me that one of the characteristics of um, uh, a, a woman, let's say, who's been raped is interviewed then by authorities, and the authority said, what did he look like? Can't remember. What was he wearing? Can't remember. And the authorities, unfortunately, see this as evidence that she's maybe making it up or pretending, or that this is some kind of fabulism on her part. To me, this absolutely, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the loss of memory is a sure sign that some traumatic event has happened, and it is now effectively like a, a machete comes down and cuts us off from the memory. And we have no access for it going forward. We survive the event, the traumatic event, go forward with our lives, our relationship with our husbands, our spouses uh, is affected, with our children is affected. And we basically uh, survive, but we don't thrive. We're not living a full life. We're living a partial life. Um, until, in Ivor's hypothesis, um, we then uh, change from being the victim of this terrible event or events and become more the warrior. In which case we choose to go towards a non-ordinary state of consciousness by whatever means. My means is breathwork. Um, and in that 
non-ordinary state of consciousness with the set and setting absolutely in place. Uh, the person knows completely that they're safe, they're supported for the duration. The trauma can arise. In the non-ordinary state into which we've been put where the memory is held in cohate in the body, the trauma can arise again, which is not a re-experiencing because we know absolutely that we are safe, but it is a revisiting. And in this revisiting of the trauma, we remember graphic details. We may remember the coldness of the table edge against which we were pushed as we were being raped, etc. And in this remembering, the trauma itself, previously held in cohate in the body, caught and held, um, becomes part of our normal memory system. It's objectified. It is no longer us who is um, unable to function properly. We can remember this as an event that happened in 1992, and it is now over. So the normal uh, circuitry of memory uh, becomes available to us again. We cannot change history. The event happened. It was disgusting. It was awful. It was horrific. But our emotional connection to it changes. We are less um, under the influence of, of, the, of the traumatic event, the, emo the emotional event. Um, uh, there's a movie called uh, A Beautiful Mind, I think, and uh, the man had many, many... Um, he carried forward a lot of uh, people from his student days throughout his life. And then at a certain point in his life, he realized, hang on a minute, I'm 50 years old. These people are still 20, in their 20s. And he realized that this it was a, a, a concoction of his mind that these people were inhabiting his life, and he was able to kind of keep them at a distance. And that's really a fair analogy to what to the relationship that we can then create post-trauma to the trauma itself by, yes, it's in memory, I remember it, it was terrible, but I am less affected by it. So uh, since uh, I studied with Stan Groff in 1994-96, uh, I've been practicing breath work um, in New York with groups and uh, working with Stan and uh, people in um, uh, week-long workshops, meditation and breath work together with Jack Cornfield, and also offering one-on-one -on -one work with breath work. And in this time, I have uh, seen, experienced, observed in the people with whom I work this effect of the person comes in and they have internal problems based on a traumatic experience or experiences that then are resolved by uh, going towards the trauma, by entering a non-ordinary state in, uh, with breath work, and the trauma is allowed to arise, and they can, with the assistance of uh, myself and other people who do this work, uh, stay with it. And that is all that is required, to stay with the trauma, to stay with the memory, to uh, not run away from it, in other words. Uh, and that's the, you know, the role of uh, the attendant. Um, uh, my description, the, the favorite description of my, my role, I'm not a therapist, trained therapist, um, is a uh, therapeutist. And therapeutist is the original meaning of the word from which we derive our word therapist. But the definition of the word therapeutist from the Greek is an attendant at the healing process. So my role as an attendant is to support the person, to give them emotional support if they need, to answer questions if they need, to hold their hands, blankets, water, help to the bathroom, all that good stuff, and that's all. There is no intervention. I offer no advice, ask no questions, but allow the person to stay as deeply as possible in the non-ordinary state to which they have arrived by the breathwork. Um, and as I say, in this work, I have seen over and over and over again, uh, sometimes literally before my eyes in real time, where somebody can sit up and say, it's over. Somebody who was uh, 
sexually abused within the family. Everybody in the family knew it. She knew it. Nobody said a word. It was an Italian family, so Omerta took over. She had had to suck this up and live with it. She was 65 years old, had never been married, was now looking at the rest of her life childless and without a relationship. She said that she had had a, a series of uh, relationships throughout her life that she described as dirty sex, nothing of any meaning or real emotional power or value. And she sat up in the middle of the session and basically just said, it's over. She had come to a point where she realized that it was the past, had nothing to do with her. She did not do this. She had no deserved role in this, and yet she was carrying it. But it lifted. And this is the staying with the difficult. Rilke says we should go towards the difficult. Go towards the difficult in an unordinary state, supported and loved, and stay with whatever comes up, understanding that whatever comes up needs to come up. And our role in the final analysis is to allow, as with psychology and psychiatry, the subconscious to arise. We see it, we engage with it, and let it go. Now, this letting go, do we let go? No, we do not let go. We are let go. It is released. And this is the a genius to my mind of Ivor Brown's hypothesis is that the release happens within the body by whatever complex mechanisms <laughs> we know nothing about. Um, and we are literally released from the emotional impact of the trauma <clears throat> that we've suffered. So seeing this over and over and over again, over many years since 1996, um, you know, I do my work and I say, well, this needs to be known. This needs to be acknowledged. This needs to be um, known. And uh, Stan Groff and Ivor Brown uh, had this fruitful relationship, as I say, in the 80s. Um, and the, the, the article, the hypothesis in the Irish Journal of Psychiatry had received not one citation. Stan was at that time uh, a um, roving editor or whatever they called of a magazine. The magazine was called Revision and their remit was to republish articles that, um, that had been published and forgotten. So Stan uses his leverage to get the article republished in Revision magazine in 1990. Still no response from anybody in the psychiatric community. So I took it on myself a couple of years ago to contact Ivor Brown uh, in Dublin. He's uh, 90 years old. I was at his uh, birthday um, in March. And he had said in the article that he felt that this a uh, hypothesis could be verified. So I felt, well, if it could be verified, let's find a way to verify it. Let's actually do it. So he was very open to this. He said he was tickled by my approach. And uh, uh, the person who had introduced me to, um, to Ivor had, in fact, been a patient, a client of Ivor's. Uh, uh, he doesn't practice breathwork anymore because breathwork is pretty vigorous. Um, he practices hypnotic regression. And uh, this contact who'd introduced us had gone to Iva as a client because he was suffering from alcoholism and, uh, you know, his, his life was, uh, he's a double PhD. He was a director of the Abbey Theatre in, in Dublin, but he couldn't function. And his marriage and his whole life was uh, uh, in a shambles. And he goes to Iva and is hypnotically regressed and uh, remembers that he was sexually abused by two members of the Christian Brotherhood, which is a subset of the uh, Roman Catholic Church, while he was a young, a young, a young boy. And uh, with two more hypnotic regression sessions with Iva and a couple of breathwork groups that he went to in Dublin, he pretty much cleared himself and is now functioning happily uh, from this immersion in the uh, non-ordinary states induced by uh, breathwork and hypnotic regression. He had a friend, has a friend, 
uh, who is a professor of microbiology at NUI Galway National Institute of National NUI National University of Ireland in Galway, which is a very fine uh, university in the top one percent of universities worldwide, and. Uh, his friend, uh, uh, his professor uh, 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 Joshi, was very interested in this, um, in this, in what had happened with how he had uh, healed himself, been healed by working with Ivor and with breathwork, because one of the things, the main thing he's studying is the microbiome, which is the flora and fauna within our gut, five pounds uh, weight within our bodies, on our skin, and everywhere in our bodies that is seen to be uh, det uh, determining, uh, determining our mental and physical health more than we could ever imagine. This, uh, this uh, focus on the microbiome grew out of the, um, uh, the Genome Project uh, and is, a, a, is a, a, a child of the Genome Project. So uh, Professor Joshi and others in, in his field had identified that one of the main uh, negative effects on the microbiome, yes, the food we eat, is it biological, is it, you know, all the, all the elements, uh, physical elements that we put into our bodies. Um, the most, after antibiotics, which of course uh, just wipe much of it out and uh, affect it very negatively, the, the first non-material uh, negative affect to the microbiome was stress. So he had uh, contacted Ivor Brown by the time I met him, and I met uh, uh, Professor Joshi at NUI Galway, and he was very interested in studying this as well from his pers perspective as a microbiologist. Um, and uh, so we formed a team uh, to, to do this. And the project basically is that uh, we will, you know, my end of things, our end of things is to offer the breath work and hypnotic regression and other forms that can bring a person to a non-ordinary state of consciousness to release the trauma, to release their trauma that's caught and held. The supposition being that with that internal stress, this toxic material in the body that's calling, causing uh, symptomatic behavior problems, alcoholism, whatever it may be, that this, re this uh, release of the trauma will result in a lowering of stress within the individual going forward, and that uh, the stress will be measurable by taking blood before and after and other measures that uh, uh, Professor Joshi will institute uh, to be able to see, does this lowering of stress, the presumed lowering of stress from the release of trauma, does this lowering of, of stress affect positively the, the microbiome? Um, so we've formed this project. Uh, it's absolutely in the embryonic stage, but it is going forward, and uh, we hope to... Um, uh, yeah, we hope, <laughs> we hope to complete it in uh, a number of years um, with the appropriate funding and so on and so on. Um, uh, the, um, uh, we're, we're expecting, you know, to start a research project like this, you have to have some hope that, that you know, what you're thinking is correct and will, in fact, be fruitful. We are expecting one to validate Ivor Brown's hypothesis of unexperienced experience. Because if trauma is released, and tra if trauma was occasioned 20 years ago and is released today, then where's it been all that time? It's been caught and held within the body uh, by some mechanism that entry into non-ordinary states that, that, that has shut down our memory system, regular memory, long-term, short-term memory, to be able to access it. We have accessed it, we have, it, and it has been released. We don't do anything to release it except by staying with the trauma in a supported set and setting. So that, uh, his hypothesis will be validated. It will also validate to our view the condition of non-ordinary consciousness itself. Uh, at the present time, non-ordinary consciousness is seen by the orthodoxy as spacing out nonsense. It's not... Uh, uh, 
a, the Transpersonal Psychology Association um, uh, made an application to the American Psychiatric Society Association, I'm sorry, uh, some years ago for a division within orthodox psychiatry to include transpersonal psychology, and it was dismissed out of, out of hand by the orthodoxy as this is irrelevant, it's, it's, there's nothing to do. So it will also validate uh, the, um, the uh, need, actually, <laughs> of us to enter a non-ordinary state on occasions. And uh, on an evolutionary scale, nothing remains within us that is useless. It would have fallen away a long time ago. So the fact that we can go to a non-ordinary state, and in fact, in our view, need to go to a non-ordinary state every now and again, will itself be validated by the, uh, the, uh, the results of the research. Um, and it will also, to our view, put the lie to the idea that there is no connection from Descartes between mind and body. Because we will have brought from the deepest hiddenest part of the psyche, material, Im, uh, I say material, not physical material, but psychic material, which then affects the deepest part of our biology. So the, the loss, the, the release of trauma resulting in the uh, lowering of stress will, we believe, affect the microbiome positively, and that this will... Uh, uh, Settle that argument uh, quite quite handily, and as I say, we've uh, uh, formed a. Um, I live and, and, and work in New York. Um, uh, we've formed what's called a 501c3, which is a nonprofit organization, in order to receive funding for this, which will be considerable. Uh, my own seat of the pants estimate is two to three million over two to three years. Um, that might be hugely optimistic. I don't know. But anyway, um, we have also created a website uh, to augment this presentation and to uh, explain the project in more detail, breath work, and other forms that we may be permitted to use uh, that would relate to uh, the material of this kind of conference. So that's uh, what I wanted to say. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions or anything at all? <laughs> I'd be happy to. Yeah, hello. Um, I'm a To, to what, sorry, I'm... To get them to that healing work. Yes. Well, there's actually an astonishing study that was conducted by Kaiser Permanente, which is one of the largest healthcare providers in, in the States, and the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, with 17,000 subjects. Uh, it's called the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, the ACE study. And the two doctors who put the uh, uh, study together had the idea that um, from their interaction with patients, that some patients, the, it could be a physical disease such as diabetes, for example, could have a causative factor in a childhood adverse event. And they put together this study. 17,000 people were interviewed. Their physical uh, medical records were compared with their um, uh, biographies, and the correlation was even greater than they thought. And uh, so we, uh, we are also including the ACE uh, 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 information, the, 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 the fact that this study exists within our purview as we go forward, go, go, go forward with the study, with the idea being that if uh, somebody presents with diabetes, it might seem, on the face of it, well, you know, were you abused as a child or did you suffer a childhood adverse event? And death of a parent is certainly one of the ten 
question, uh, questions in terms of uh, their assessment of what a childhood adverse event is, does this um, correlate with your physical uh, condition? And I have to say that from the age of 35 till uh, I was 65, uh, I suffered mightily from colitis. Now, gastrointestinal conditions are absolutely, you know, tension in the stomach, we hold things in the gut, fear, all that, all, all that stuff. So, um, you know, I have, a, <laughs> I have skin in the game in terms of the uh, truth of um, that, that, that study and that linkage between childhood trauma and uh, onset of physical diseases later in life. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Jade. My name is Jade Hyde Ullman, and I work for MAPS. I was curious to find out if um, I heard about a new nonprofit called Cytea that's doing uh, research with polytopic breakfast. I was wondering if that's the same nonprofit or a different. No, we formed a nonprofit. Uh, we're called Rebecoming. The idea being that uh, it's something that I felt uh, quite, for quite a while that. When we do this work, when we uh, offer ourselves to, we submit to a non-ordinary state of consciousness and we allow the feelings to happen, allowing is the huge, the huge word in all this work, um, that um, we re-become who we really are. We more fully can inhabit the person that the creator created without all the adverse effects and everything. So it's called Rebecoming. We have the, uh, uh, the, the organization rebecoming.org, which means it's a 501c3. If you go to rebecoming.org on uh, the computer, it should come up and uh, you know, give a, more, uh, some, a little more facts than I can give in, 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 in the half hour here. Yeah, thank you, Jade. And, and, and I'm sorry, that what happens? What is it? Well, essentially, the non ordinary consciousness into which we are thrown by the psyche is involuntary. We are a victim, we are endangered, the organism understands this and cuts us off from the memory. Then, going forward, we say, I've had enough of this. And we enter a non-ordinary state by whatever means, and we are absolutely agnostic as to how that uh, could and should happen. We happen to practice breath work. Um, but of course, <laughs> as this conference demonstrates, there are many ways of achieving this same, and David's talk uh, uh, being, being one of them. So we change from being a victim, uh, and it is cut off for us, to being more of a warrior, where we allow this material to come up. We honor the material, because this material does not want to be in us any more than we want it to be in us. So it longs to come up, and this gives it an opportunity to come up. And if we can stay with it, and uh, you know, for a period of time, 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever it is, it simply releases. And this is the absolute epicenter of Ivor Brown's hypothesis that we release ourselves. We, we don't release ourselves by our effort. We are released from it. Does that answer a little? <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>